How's everybody doing? Awesome, awesome. Here's a question I want to ask you out the gate is, do you have one of those friends where they're always trying new stuff, like they're always taking some new supplement or they're, they're going on some new diet, you know, they, they're, they're something, some new exercise, they're, they're, they're working out. Anybody have, have one of those friends, you know? I, I've, I've got one of those friends, <laughs> you're pointing fingers. I, I've got one of those friends and, and he calls me and he says, hey, I'm taking this and it changed my life. It changed my life. You, you, you've got to try it. And I'm like, I'm, I'm a sucker for that testimony. Because I'm like, I want my life to. I mean, what if you got something that, that you know, changed your life? But the deal with my friend is it, he, this happens a lot. Like I'm always, he's always like, hey, a teaspoon of apple cider vinegar. Or like one time I had restless leg and he comes over with some oils, you know. He's like, put it on the bottom of your feet. I was like, is this inviting evil spirits into the room? You know, I don't want that. And and so he calls and he's like, man, this stuff changed my life. You got to get you some. And so I'm like, okay, well, what, what is it? And he says, have you ever heard of Metamucil? <laughs> and uh, I'm like, people get excited about it. I don't know. Like, and I'm like, I think so. Like my grandmother something I what but that's his thing and I love how excited he gets when 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 there's something that works for him you know he's eager to share it with everybody and you think about that testimony man this stuff changed my life this changed my life I don't know if you've thought about this before but that's how we got here that, that testimony was, was really like, hey, I, I met a man and he changed my life. And that went from one person to the next, to the next, to the next. It's like, hey, this, this man, this story of this man, these people who are telling me of this man, they, he changed my life. He changed the trajectory of my life. He changed my desires. He, he changed who I hung out with, the way I dressed, the way I talk. He changed my life. Uh, there was a guy who was the minister of the satanic church in South Africa. And he shared a story on Facebook that went viral. In fact, I want you to watch this. Watch this man's story. Why did I leave and why did I resign from the South African satanic church as well as why did I turn my back on satanism? I did this interview and after the interview, this lady came to me. And in this interview, I said, I don't believe in Jesus. And I don't believe that Jesus Christ exists because I didn't. And she came to me after the interview, after I said that. And she hugged me and she held me in a way that I've never been loved. In the occult, there is certain rituals that you do to ascend to the top of a pyramid. And you can only do a certain amount at a time. And after that interview, after that interview, I had a meeting with council members at the, at the church. And they said, okay, great, now we've done all these interviews and people know and it's growing, Satanism is growing, and believe me people, it is, it's growing. And I had to do a ritual by myself to see what is the next step? What is the next thing? How do I get more, more power, more influence? And I did this ritual and I opened myself up. And Jesus, appeared and I was extremely cocky and I said whatever if you are Jesus you need to prove it <laughs> and he flooded me with the most beautiful love and energy and I recognized it immediately because that woman at the radio station showed it to me. That's how I recognized the love of Christ. Yeah, amen. 
It's a minister of the satanic church in South Africa telling you why he's leaving the satanic church as a leader in the satanic church. And, and why would that video go viral? Why would people watch that and forward it on and say, hey, you gotta watch this, you gotta see this, hey, look at this. Because he's, he's saying his message is very simple. Jesus changed my life. Jesus changed my life. How many of you are here this morning and, and you would say that? that, that's true for you, just by show of hands, you say, hey, Jesus changed my life. Like, Jesus changed my life. And you, you see those hands go up and you begin to understand how we get here, how one person goes to the next, to the next, to the next. It's a really simple message. You know, we're not talking about deep theology here. It's the reality that this man lived a perfect life. He died, he raised from the grave. And there is power in that message that when we trust in his death and resurrection for the forgiveness of our sins, his Holy Spirit rushes into our life and changes us. He changes us. And I think we have to ask the question, why? Jesus, why did you change me? Why do you want me to live in this world in a way that is different from those you've yet to change? What should my life look like and how do I take that message and move it forward? We're in Acts chapter three today. In Acts chapter three, Peter and John go to the temple to worship and they see a man outside the temple begging for money and there is a miraculous healing that occurs. This is a man who could not walk and then he can walk. So today, I, in the message, I have the challenge uh, of addressing miracles, miraculous healings, and also the call for us, the application for us to use life change as a platform to proclaim the gospel. That, that life-changing message that the Holy Spirit also changes hearts and that we would carry that message forward. And it's ironic that um, I'm up here for a number of reasons. Uh, this week I was the sickest I've been as an adult uh, coming back from Africa. And so I had a friend uh, that was going to teach and Monica said, you, you should tell them, you've been miraculously healed. And, and I would say, I don't know. I, I, I don't know if it's, you know, just served its time. And all I know is I'm up here, okay? And uh, I was in bed for three days prior to being up here. That's what I know. And if Jesus changed your life, we should tell someone about it. Like, we should tell people that he changed our life. And so let me recap Acts chapter one. Jesus says, hey, the Holy Spirit is going to come to the earth. And then Acts chapter two, he does. And there are these men and they are preaching and, and there are people there uh, uh, that speak different languages, but they all understand them. This is a miracle. The Holy Spirit is taking this message of Jesus Christ and he is, is not letting anything prevent it from going forward, including a language barrier. And Peter boldly declares the gospel right there for the first time. And it says 3,000 people are added to the church and so that's the number of people that, that gather here. It would be like if Harris Creek was the only church on the planet Earth. That's what's happening right now. And so Nate gave a great message on Pentecost. And then Dale last week said, and so now let's pull up, look into the window of the first church and see what's happening there. And he says what marks this place is their devotion 
their generosity and their commitment to evangelism or them being evangelistic. And he kind of showed us this picture of the church just caring for one another, gathering, being devoted to the apostles, teaching the breaking of the bread. And then this week, we're going to move into Peter and John are are going to the temple. I want to say this to, to set up this text. It's interesting because it was Jewish tradition, you would do a sacrifice in the morning, a sacrifice in the evening, and at 3 p.m. every day, you would go into the temple to worship. But they're Christians now, Peter and John, but they're continuing in this Jewish tradition. It's not like, you know, one day they're like, oh, we just put all of that behind us and we just do this different now. They're just continuing to worship God faithfully. They're, they're doing what they know to do faithfully. And that's where we pick up in this text. And I'll just read it all to you first before we teach it. And, and as I do, remember Dale's outline, devoted generous and evangelistic, you're going to see that carry out in this text. I'll show you. Acts 3, verse 1. One day, Peter and John were going up to the temple at the time of prayer at three in the afternoon. Now, a man who was lame from birth was being carried to the temple gate called Beautiful, where he was put every day to beg from those in to uh, those going into the temple courts. When he saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for money. Peter looked straight at him, as did John. Then Peter said, look at us. So the man gave them his attention, expecting to get something from them. Then Peter said, silver or gold I do not have, but what I do have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. Taking him by the right hand, he helped him up, and instantly the man's feet and ankles became strong. He jumped to his feet and began to walk. Then he went with them into the temple courts, walking and jumping and praising God. When all the people saw him walking and praising God, they recognized him as the same man who used to sit begging at the temple gate called Beautiful. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. They're going to the temple uh, to worship like they did every day as an act of devotion. They see a man asking for something and they give him even more than what he's asking for as an act of generosity. And then what's going to happen next, the crowds gather and Peter says, hey guys, since I have your attention, let me share the gospel with you as an act of evangelism. You see that outline laid over this text as well. And so let's just break it down. Uh, As we do, we're going to look at how, um, we're going to look at opportunities for life change, our role in life change, and why miracles occur. It says, one day Peter and John were going to the temple uh, at the time of prayer at three in the afternoon. Now a man who was lame from birth was being carried to the temple gate called Beautiful, where he was put every day to beg from those going into the temple courts. Uh, the gate called Beautiful was the bronze gate. It was the, the most ornate uh, of the three. Uh, there is, it was a shortcut into the temple courts. This is the gate that you would enter into with your tithes and your alms. Tithes was a practice that is where you would give some of your income to uh, the, the work of God. We still practice this today, that you would be generous with a portion of, of the money, that the, of God's money that he entrusts to you, that you would give that to his work. But it was also a practice that they would give what was called alms. Alms was money specifically for the poor, uh, for, for those who could not work for themselves or provide from themselves. And this was the gate that they would enter into with, those, with that money. And so this man is just being opportunistic, right? This would be like if, if somebody was sitting under the giving boxes back there and we were on a cash basis here at Harris Creek and they were just laying right under those giving boxes saying, hey, as you, as you give to the Lord, might you also give some to me so that I can eat? This is where that man is sitting. And, and so these guys, as I told you, they're not going into the mall kind of looking for someone to heal. They're not seeking out a miracle. They're just going in their ordinary 
obedient ways and God has someone in their path and they're faithful with that person. And so my first point from the text is opportunities open out of ordinary obedience. Uh, Opportunities open out of ordinary obedience. I was going to say opportunities open out of our ordinary obedience, but that would be seven O's, which would be a new world record, and I didn't want to mess with that. And so, uh, uh, quite the alliteration, but opportunities open out of ordinary obedience. It's, it's a supernatural miracle that occurs out of ordinary faithful worship and discipline. It's, it's like what Jesus says to the church in Philadelphia in Revelation 3. He says, you've kept my word and not denied my name, and so I've opened doors for you. It's like what Paul prays. He says, and, and pray that we would be faithful and that doors would open for our message out, out of our faithfulness. These guys are just going along the way They're not asking God for a sign. They just see someone who is in need. And by the power of the Spirit of God, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, they meet the need. For the fame and the renown and the glory of Jesus Christ. And this healing, you might be like, oh, it's just one of the healings in scriptures. No, this healing, this is a major pivot in the text. This is how you got here. This is, is a healing where the gospel explodes. We're gonna see that about 12,000 people come to faith in Jesus Christ through this healing just in this moment. I mean, the church grows exponentially because of what the Holy Spirit does in and through this man. Jesus tells us not to ask for a sign. He says a wicked generation uh, asks for a sign in Matthew 12 and Matthew 16. And so we're just, we're operating in faithfulness. We're, We're looking where we can be faithful. My daughter and I just got back from Zambia. We were there on a mission trip where we each had, I had uh, 11 uh, nine-year-old guys, roughly nine-year-old. She had 11 nine-year-old girls and we were leading camp and, and um, te- sharing the gospel with them. And then if they placed faith in Jesus, teaching them then to share the gospel with their family and, and uh, classmates and whatnot. And, and, you know, in the trip, she said something that people often have said to me on these kinds of trips. She says, Dad, I just wish I understood the culture better. And so there, it's it's a different culture. She had to wear what was called a chitange, which is like a a skirt um, to be respectful in that culture. There was a particular dress code. Uh, There were words we couldn't say. Uh, Pants, like, hey, I like your pants. That pants means underwear there. And so we created some awkward conversations in that. Uh, She was like, hey, I like your pants. And this guy started blushing and we didn't know why. And, um, and, uh, and silly, like we were with kids. So it's like, oh, you're acting silly. That means something different there. That, that's uh, that's a, quite the insult. And, and so we had to learn the culture. She said, Dad, I wish I understood the culture better. And she said, she said I wish that I could speak the language because everywhere we went, we would have to have these interpreters with us. And sometimes the interpreters would leave us for a minute to run to the restroom or, or to you know, get lunch or whatever. And we would, you, you feel rather helpless because it's like we don't speak the language of these nine-year-olds and it's, it's hard you know, to, to gather, every, hey guys, gather around and the, you know, they're doing this too. And you're like, no, no, in a circle. And they're like, oh yeah, circle. <laughs> And then they run off and you're like, come back. And they're like, I don't know what you say and run away, you know? And, and so there's just this language barrier. And she's like, and dad, I wish it wasn't so hard. I love, I love this country so much. God loves these people so much. Uh, I wish it wasn't so hard to get here. And, and I hear this all the time on these trips. I'm like, well, we're, guess what? We're going to a place where we understand the culture, we speak the language, and we're there every day in, in our normal faithfulness, right? And um, so we, we get on the, the flight home, we're on the 16-hour leg, and it's me on the aisle, Presley in the middle, and then this, this 17-year-old young man from Dallas on the other side of her. 
and uh, he begins to hit on her, and, um, and I'm contemplating hitting him, and, <laughs> and uh, no, I'm thinking, he doesn't have a chance. He didn't have a chance at not hearing the gospel, you know, like, that, and there's just no way, that's, we're 16 hours, you're stuck, you gotta get past both of us, you know. So I'm like, Presley, how do you wanna do it? You know, you want bridge illustration? You want me to grab the Evangel Cube? It's in my bag up there. Like, what, wh- wh- where do we wanna go with this, right? It, it's just, it, it's not like an opportunity we had to go find. And so if you're here and you're like, man, I, but I just don't have those opportunities. Take a deep breath. And, and know that God is going to lay them before you. Ask him for eyes to see them and and to be faithful in the midst of them. Give yourself a break, he's not mad at you. I'm I'm confident he's not mad at you. He's not disappointed in you. You didn't catch him off guard, right, with a lack of courage. He's not thrown for a loop by that. He's just saying, hey, as you leave here, I want you to open your eyes. And look for those opportunities as you are just being faithful. So Peter and John, they're going up there to the temple to worship. They're hit up by this lame beggar. So the scripture says, at verse three, when he saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for money. Peter looked straight at him, as did John. Peter said, look at us. So the man gave them his attention, expecting to get something from them. Then Peter said, silver or gold, I do not have, but what I do have, I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. Taking him by the right hand, he helped him up, and instantly the man's feet and ankles became strong. He jumped to his feet and began to walk. Then he went with them into the temple courts, walking and jumping and praising God. What a scene. A couple observations from the text. The apostles are not rich. There there are entire denominations that teach that these men who followed Jesus the closest were very wealthy. He says, hey, we don't have money. We don't have money, but we can give you something more than what you're asking for. This is a miraculous healing. There, There are Uh, nerve endings, sendings, uh, signals to muscles and tendons that have atrophied over time that are forming and strengthening. And this man is standing up for the very first time in his life and he's testing his new legs and he begins to leap and fist pump the air and, and worship. And so we have to deal with this. There's what I respectfully, humbly would say are, are two heresies that surround the topic of healing. One of them is that God desires everyone to be healed and so if you are not healed, you're doing something wrong. I don't believe that. This one, uh, equally dangerous, maybe more dangerous, God no longer works in that way and, and doesn't heal people like that today. I don't believe that that's true. What I do believe is true is that God does heal people and the healings that I see in the scriptures, the miracles that I see in the scripture are for the purpose of making way for a greater healing, which is the one of our heart. So he may heal legs to heal someone's heart. What God desires is not just to prolong our life on earth, but to offer us eternal life with him, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to eternal life in Jesus. This man is expecting one thing, but they give him more than he even knows to ask for. Let, Let me show you something. This guy's outside the temple, right? Um, he, he's begging outside the temple. 
there's commentaries that would say this man has probably never been inside the temple courts. Uh, In 2 Samuel chapter 5 verse 8, it says that the blind and the lame are not allowed inside the temple. Um, There's some disagreement around this, but there's a good chance that this man has never been inside the temple. So his entire life, the closest he's ever come to inside the temple is standing at this gate and begging for money. This is his lot. He's healed. And where does he go immediately? Where does he go? He goes inside. (laughs) He goes inside. He's outside his whole life. He he has an interaction with the Holy Spirit and he is inside. This is us, the the church. We meet people outside the church. We meet them where they are. We we assess their need. We meet their need and we bring them inside the church. Hey, come in with me and praise the God. Praise the God who allowed your need to be met. And I am just the vessel. Don't look at me. Don't look at her. Don't look at him. It's the Lord Jesus Christ of Nazareth. That's who has met your need. He changed my life. My second point, the gospel gives generously. The gospel gives generously. He's asking for change and he gets life change. He's asking for money and he gets more than he knows what to ask for. Now in the moment, as you interact with somebody, you may need to meet their physical need first before they can hear you or have you meet their spiritual need. Um, But you need to know that if you raised your hand and you said, Jesus changed my life, then you have something to offer them that might be, or most likely will be, greater than they know what to ask you for. They might ask you for money, a sandwich, some gas, a bus ticket, and you have something that is even greater than they know what to ask you for. And if someone is thirsty, by all means, give them a drink. But if their soul is a desert and we don't even attempt to quench that thirst, then in some ways we've done them a disservice. Or, well, not in some ways, we've done them a disservice. And so I'm not saying, I, I wanna be abundantly clear, I don't wanna be misunderstood here. We should meet the physical needs of people We absolutely should. We should assess their need and we should meet their need. But we also must attach it to their spiritual need. Uh, Go, like understand that they're going to live, their soul will be somewhere forever and ever and ever and ever and ever. And so we meet their spiritual need as well. What's strange about this story for me personally is I lived it. In, in a weird way, I'm, I'm, I'm in Israel and I'm walking from the Mount of Olives toward the temple, toward the gate called Beautiful. And there on the side of the road is a, a lame person, a person who cannot walk, begging for money. And I'm with another pastor friend and we know the story. And I just said, are you gonna tell him to get up and walk? <laughs> and, uh, and he said appropriately, he said, I will if God wants me to. And when he said that, I will if God wants me to, somebody had just walked by this man without making eye contact and they just dropped a dollar in his his proximity. So they just walked by and dropped a dollar. And my friend said, you know, I'm confident he doesn't want me to do just that. And that struck a conversation with us, between us, that, um, you know, we have to slow down. That's a convicting word for me. Like as I look at my own life, like I, I can just, I can be so given to pragmatism at time. Like, oh, okay, what's going on with this, this, this broken? Okay, go, go this, do this, say this, turn here, go here, you'll be fine, you know? Like, hey, take, take, here's a prescription, you're fine, right? And we have to slow down. I need to slow down. To look at a situation, say, okay, Lord, 
What is it that you want to do here? It is so easy for me to go grab a dollar and, and just give the minimum and move on. But I don't, I don't know what's going on. And, and how would you most have me or best have me love this person? And it's going to take time. And so we slow down. We assess the need. We meet the need. We understand that the greatest healing that can happen for someone is the Holy Spirit healing their heart. And the method that, that God seems to desire to do that through is by us sharing that message. And he may use a miracle to authenticate the message, or he may not, but the greatest miracle that we can witness is someone saying, oh, wow, I was the leader of the satanic church, and I didn't believe there is Jesus, but now I'm going to follow him, and that's a miracle. It is a, a, the greatest miracle when someone does that. says in verse nine, when, the, when all the people saw him walking and praising God, they recognized him as the same man who used to sit begging at the temple gate called Beautiful. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at all that had happened to him. While the man held on to Peter and John, all the people were astonished and came running to them in the place called Solomon's Colonnade. Peter saw this and he said to them, <laughs> there's all these people just like flooding in, like, whoa, whoa, that's the guy, he's standing, he's walking, that, that guy's never stood. And, and Peter says, okay, fellow Israelites, why, why does this surprise you? Why do you stare at us as if by our own power or godliness we made this man walk? The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers has glorified his servant Jesus. You handed him over to be killed and you disowned him before Pilate, though he had decided to let him go and he begins to preach the gospel. He just says, oh, okay, now that I have your attention, yeah, 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 that's the guy, the, yes, the, the lame beggar. Yeah, he's walking, leaping, praising God, and let me tell you why. The, you know, don't, don't look at me or John like it was us. It was Jesus. You remember Jesus, right? Yeah, you killed him. Yep. Yeah, that Jesus. Yep. Yep. No, he's not dead. Turns out he came back to life and he starts preaching the gospel. My third point, miracles make way for the message. Miracles make way for the message. It, it, it says, with wonder and amazement, people uh, watched on. Uh, another word that might summarize wonder and amazement is worship. They, they worship. They see this guy and they begin to worship. And if you're following along, it, it says that as Peach, uh, Peter preaches the gospel, he's going to have two opportunities born directly from this healing. That it says over 5,000 men believed. That's men, so more than 10,000 people. When you add in women and children, probably close to 12 or 15,000 people have now been added to the church because of this miracle. This man goes from being lame his whole life to leaping. And God didn't heal this man to, to simply heal this man. He healed this man to heal the hearts of many. We're four chapters in to Acts. We move into Acts chapter four, Peter's arrested. There's three sermons been preached by Peter. And they've all relatively been the same sermon. So let me show you, like I'm gonna back up, I'm gonna go back to Acts chapter two, Pentecost, Peter's preaching, this is what he says, this is the, the crowd at Pentecost. Uh, this man Jesus was handed over to you by God's deliberate plan and foreknowledge and you with the help of wicked men put him to death by nailing him to the cross but God raised him from the dead freeing him from the agony of death because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. 
Now they go to the temple, they see a lame beggar, they tell him to get up and walk, he does, he's praising God, and now there's all these onlookers watching on, and he says this, second sermon, you killed the author of life, but God raised him from the dead, we are witnesses of this, by faith in the name of Jesus, this man whom you see and know was made strong, it is Jesus' name and the faith that comes through him that has completely healed him as you all can see. The Sanhedrin catches word that all of these Jews are converting to Christianity and following Jesus, so they come and take Peter and John. And now he's given a new audience. This is Peter to the Sanhedrin, third sermon. If we are being called to account today for an act of kindness shown to a man who is lame and are being asked how he was healed, Then know this, you and all the people of Israel, it is by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead, that this man stands before you healed. Three sermons, one message. Jesus died and came back to life, and he changes lives. Jesus died and came back to life. You trust in him, he will change your life. He changes lives. There's this thing that happens in the church, like I imagine some of you, you think, yeah, but what if I was raised in the church? Like what if my testimony is, I mean, I was born to to two faithful parents who loved me, took me to church, I I, I trusted in the gospel when I was young and I followed him. I I want to say to you, that is my favorite testimony. (laughs) It's such a beautiful testimony. It's the testimony that I pray that my children have. It's not my testimony, but it's the testimony that I want for my kids that they would just see something in God that that they desire and they would want to follow him faithfully. That's amazing. And be careful because what can happen is we can become bored with the extraordinary and we can become uh, resentful in those more big, you know, what we consider bigger stories of life change. And and what what I would commend to you is to thank God for the ways that he's preserved your faith and celebrate faithfully with so much joy and zeal when he changes someone's life. You you don't want to grow into the older brother. You don't want your heart to to grow hardened or, or just to become skeptical and cynical of the more miraculous works of God that I believe he still does to this day. If you've witnessed a miracle, God was seeking to save you or someone else. And so make sure you're you're cognizant. I believe, I'll, I'll just, I'll add in there, I think, I'm, I am fairly confident that if you witnessed, have witnessed a miracle, you do witness a miracle, God is wanting to change the heart of you or someone around you. So be asking the question, why, God? What is it that you're wanting to do? In summary, opportunities open out of our obedience. The gospel gives generously and miracles make way for the message. I've been in bed all week, um, fever all week, just some crazy <laughs> satanic flu from <laughs> Zambia. I mean, just got me, took me out. And uh, Thursday, um, I go and I sit on my front porch, just first time out of bed, and uh, just like, Lord, I'd love to teach Sunday. I'd love to teach Sunday. Seems like I'm turning the corner. 
You know, should I, God? And I'm, I'm just wrestling. I'm like, should I teach? Should I not? And, and I say this not in like, I'm not trying to test God or looking for a sign or anything. I'm just talking to God. And I say, if, you, if, you, if, if I'm going to teach, I'm going to need you to help me with a closing illustration because I don't have one. I'd been reading the text while I was sick. And, um, and right when I say that, I, I just like, I, my street's quiet. Like you just hear the birds chirping. All of a sudden I just hear this like, blood curdling yell for help help oh, help help i'm like what in the world i didn't mean like that like careful what you pray for right and i and i look across the cul-de-sac and there's this older gentleman laying underneath a car and i think he got ran over and i think what am i going to walk up on i'm, I'm scared like what i'm about to see but my adrenaline's pumping as the, the and he's still yelling just like like yelling for hell and I and I and so I run over there and I get there and he's lying in in this pool of blood and I'm I'm just overwhelmed by the situation and and so I ask he's like who's there and I'm like hey I'm here you're gonna be okay I'm, I'm your neighbor and and is anybody home and and uh and he says he says no and I run in his house I'm like is anybody here and I grab a towel and I I put his head is just completely ripped open and and so I put that on his head and, and we get him up and and uh and we get him in my truck and and I'm I'm nobody else is is there and and so I take him to the emergency room and we get out and he's he's like semi-coherent doesn't know what year it is you know and and I, I take him in I'm like hey this this is what happened they're like do you have his medical records I don't have his medical records I go on his phone I call his wife like she's come into the um, emergency room and we're in there and he has uh, a long list of, of health problems going on and and uh and it just seems like this really hopeless situation and i'm just praying like lord you gotta move here like would you save this man's life like would you help him and doctors are coming in and out and asking lots of questions that neither of us know the answers to and and it finally calms down a little bit you know and we're left in there and it just seems really hopeless. I said, all right, I gotta ask you two questions. Everybody else is asking you questions. I'm sorry, I'm gonna add two to them. Between one and 10, 10 being certain, one being not so sure. If you died today, how certain are you that you would go to heaven? And he, and he just comes to and he, and he says, I'm certain, I'm 100% certain. I'm a 10. And I said, the second question is, if you stood before God and he said, why should I let you in, what would you say? And he said, because Jesus changed my life. Jesus changed my life. And this really hopeless situation in, in one second became such a hopeful situation. Like, like hope just flooded in that room. And this man uh, with all of these health issues was just like, hey man, this is as bad as it's ever going to be. It's up and to the right from here. And we can... I don't know where this goes. I don't know what, what turns lie ahead, but I know you got something really great to look forward to. This will be a fun little reunion we have up there one day. Remember you were yelling and I was across the street all hyperventilating and whatnot. And um, yeah, anybody need healing? Like you're at this place right now. I'm not trying to be weird, but you just, you, you got something going on. You're like, man, I, I would love for God to heal me. Like I've got something physical going on. Like anybody at that place, you got, I see you back there, you right here. Anybody else? Like just raise your hand high if you don't mind. Like we, it's okay, like we love you. And, and there's a lot of us, we've been there. Everybody's been sick. I'm not trying to be weird or anything right now. And I know we're Baptist, but, um, but would you stand up? Would you stand up if you just raised your hand? Would you stand up? And uh, thank you. And, and I'm gonna need some people just to take the lead around them, but would you, would you just put a hand on them? Again, I'm not trying to be strange or anything, but just, just like lay a, a hand on a, on a back, on a shoulder, and, and uh, just say, hey, we're here, you're not alone. Like the body of Christ is around you. You feel free to put your hand on somebody else if you want, you know, and there's no, there's no magic here. This isn't about me. Like, I don't know what God wants to do. I have no idea, just trying to be faithful to his word. And so I'm just going to pray.
Father, there's so much pain in the world. There's so many overwhelming situations. And it's not as you originally intended. And I know there's brokenness and there's bitterness and I'd have no idea these friends' ailments, their, their sicknesses. I don't know if it's bones that need to be repaired or, or, or brains that need to be repaired or, or you know, our nervous system or, or what. But I know we stand in faith. And we just ask for your Holy Spirit to rush in and heal them. Would you heal them, God, please? Would you restore their health to them? Would you make them whole? And if there is a suffering that you desire us to steward, I don't say this as an add-on, a a statement of a lack of faith, but if there's a suffering that you desire us to steward, would you help us to steward it well? In, In a way that's faithful and glorifying to you. And if there's anyone right now just wrestling with the the guilt of not standing or or needing healing, I just pray that you would heal that guilt, that you would uh, uh, prevent the enemy from speaking that over them and just heal them even as they sit there. That we would experience that and that it it, it wouldn't be something that I would get the credit for or someone near them praying for them would get the credit for, that it would just be something that Jesus Christ of Nazareth the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. All the credit and all the glory is yours. Would you edify our faith and edify our church in this way? Would you heal us where we're broken and restore us where we need it? And hear us, God, we trust you. We trust you and we thank you for the hope that we have in Jesus Christ.